that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, well, one of these days, now seriously, one of these days, if you hear that Pastor Keith died while he was preaching in the pulpit, you'll know I went away happy, uh, you know. <laughs> I went away the way the Lord would have me to go. And uh, I'd be awesome, you know, to be preaching the Word and then all of a sudden be instantly in the presence of Jesus, wouldn't it, really? I mean, I'd be... That'd be really a way to, way to go, uh, actually. Yeah, just preaching and ministering and talking about the Lord and the Holy Spirit's work and all of that. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're just standing face to face with Jesus. And that'd be awesome, you know. And uh, so anyway, one of these days we're all going to be taken out of here. This is what the book of Revelation teaches us. And we've been in the book of Revelation for uh, about, what, 15 weeks or so. Now, what is this? Yeah, this is uh, six, outline number 16. So we've been in it for about 15 weeks before, and we've been through all kinds of things in the book of Revelation thus far. I mean, the book begins by telling us and giving us its own outline in verse 19 of chapter 1, just to call it back to your thought patterns. The book is about, well, verse 1 itself says, the revelations of Jesus Christ. So the book is about revealing Jesus Christ. So if you study the book of Revelation and you don't see Jesus Christ, you're missing the whole point of the book. The point of the book is not to you know, give you Star Wars visions and uh, cartoonish figures and these crazy chaotic issues that pop up. The book is about revealing Jesus Christ to you and to, and, and to allow us to see what Jesus Christ does in these last days where earth is, hangs in the balance and, you know, judgment of God and all of those things that have been promised. We know that God's judgment is true. It's holy. It's righteous. It's real. And we have a world right now, and this is not hard for us to see, that is rebelling in every way imaginable against the things of God. I mean, you, you know, this is not news to you. I know it's not. You Watch any newscast you want to watch, whichever flavor you prefer, and they all do have flavors, by the way. I'm not sure we have any unbiased stuff anymore. Everything has a bias one way or another. But even when you watch it, it's just, you know, one thing after another that opens the book up. I'm serious. I, because I study it, and I've, you know, been now so long with the Lord, and I've been through this book three or four times over my 40-something years of preaching, uh, I began to, 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 to know some of the things to look for and some of the things that I was thinking back in the 70s when I preached on the book and in the 80s when I preached on the book and in the 90s when I preached on the book. I hadn't preached on the book this first time in the 2000s, I think, that I preached on the book. But every one of those revelations... Uh, it just seemed like the, uh, the pictures got clearer and clearer of what, what was happening on the earth based on what the book was saying about this is what's going to happen. So the book says it's about the things which you have seen, which is the glory of Jesus Christ in chapter 1, the things that are, which are seven church ages, seven letters to seven churches that represent a church age, and we went through all of that, and, and the, we're in the last age. Everybody say, the last. the last. Now, what does that imply? There are no more, right? There's not going to be an extension. Uh, this is it. This is the last age. It's typified by a church in chapter 3 of Revelation called the church at Laodicea. The Laodicean church is the church that wasn't hot and it wasn't cold. And it made Jesus sick. And he said, ah, because you are not hot or cold, I'm going to have to vomit you out of my mouth. So this is the age we're in. We're in an age where the church uh, is still here. The age of grace is still functioning. The Holy Spirit is still convicting and people are still being saved. The Holy Spirit is still drawing and wooing men and women to the heart of God. Churches, and not all churches are, are spew-worthy, but the general, the general concept of, of the church is uh, compromise, uh, 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 playing games, uh, 
getting by, uh, going along to get along, uh, just that age of compromise, that, 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 that age of, uh, of not really standing for anything except uh, survival, you know? I mean, let's don't, let's, don't ra- let's don't stand against anything. That way we can't be criticized. And, and, uh, and, and all of these terrible things that are happening in our society, I mean, much less the society of the world. I'm just talking about our society where traditional values have been assaulted and attacked in every imaginable way, where human sexuality is a question now, you know. I mean, there was a time when it was easy to put your gender on a, on a form you fill out. You are either male or female. But now because of the craziness and the attack of this world we live in, uh, you have many more options than male or female. Oh, my goodness, this is ridiculous. The family, the home, marriage. I mean, we've redefined marriage. Marriage is not between a man and a woman like the Bible says it is. And the Bible does clearly declare that that marriage is between a man and a woman. God established marriage, not the Supreme Court of the United States. And marriage is between a man and a woman for the purpose of propagating uh, the creation. In other words, the, the reason that you get married is so you can have children and, and, you, can, and you can have people born and, and repopulate the earth. Uh, that's the purpose for it. And children can grow up in a home with a mom and a dad and they can be reared to love God and know God and obey uh, the balances of life and all of those kind of things. But what's happening now in the world we're living in is that everything that makes a nation great, every value that makes it strong, every rule and every, and every nuance of everything that, that, that gave it power and made it uh, 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 constructive and virile and, and life-giving is being attacked. And the standards are being torn down in, in, in every case, everywhere, all the time. Well, that's the age we live in. That's the Laodicean age. That's the age that begins to make God sick so that he will spew, <laughs> spew you out of his mouth. That's what's going on on earth. Right. We've been taken to heaven over the last couple of weeks as John, our representative, John, the Christian writer, John, full of the Holy Spirit, one of the disciples of Christ on the Isle of Patmos, a prisoner for the Lord's sake on a desert isle out in a rock island out in the Mediterranean Sea shortly offshore, is visited by the Holy Spirit and is taken up to heaven at the beginning of chapter 4. He said, and I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I was taken up and heard a voice said, come up here and I'll show you what shall be hereafter. So John goes and stands in heaven, and the first thing he sees is this tremendous worship service. He's taken up immediately into the presence of God, and, and, he, and he sees this throne, and on this throne is this tremendous vision of God, this brilliant, bright, uh, God looks like a diamond, God looks like a ruby flash, and he has this gigantic emerald rainbow around there, and there are these strange creatures with four faces that are flying around and six wings, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is he who sits on the throne, and man, they're just per- worshiping and praising him. It's unbelievable. They're talking about, you know, creation and the 24 elders that are there are representatives of the church that has come up out of the world. I mean, what what we're seeing here in the first picture in heaven is we're seeing what happens after he calls us up. He calls us up and then all of a sudden uh, we go through a, a marriage supper of the Lamb's. We go through a a time where we stand before the Lord, and as 1 Corinthians 3 tells us, that we all stand there, and the Lord evaluates our life 
based on what we've done with what he's given us to do with. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. I, I know this is not new to you because you've heard me mention it before, but Jesus has a judgment seat. There's a great white throne at the end of everything that God sits on the throne and all the lost of the world gather before that throne and some books are open and if your name is not found written in the book of life, then you're cast into hell with the devil and all of his crop. That's at the end of all things. That, that's the great white throne judgment. Only lost people will be there. We might be spectating, but we're not gonna stand before God because we, we, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we've already been judged at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, all right, here's what you had to live with. You can look at your neighbor and you can think this. I'm not going to be evaluated by what you do or how you live. I'm going to be evaluated by how, what I did with what God gave me to do with, and then he's gonna give you a crown. If you did well, and there are five crowns that are mentioned, and these crowns are like, these are not diadems like a king's crown. Jesus wears a diadem. Jesus is the king. What you wear are, are, is, is called really a victor's crown. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a laurel leaf. Uh, uh, you, you've seen in, in some movies, you've seen like these little crowns where Olympic athletes are crowned with this little uh, wrapped uh, type of crown. It's called the victor's crown. And it's, a, it, it's, it, it's called, in the Greek, it's Stephanos. So when you're given the Stephanos, it means you have achieved in some area righteousness or soul winning or rejoicing or, or uh, martyr, whatever. There are five of them that are mentioned and you get these crowns and you get them at the judgment seat of Christ. So if we have any crowns and if there are any elders there and if there are anything like that, it means something's already happened for that to be true when, he, when we see it. So here we are, and we're around the throne, and it's rejoicing, and everybody's talking about creation, and we're just praising and just, just going wild. And then in chapter five, uh, John says, uh, you know, I looked and uh, uh, they brought a scroll out, and in this scroll, uh, it was sealed. It had seven seals, and the question was asked, uh, who, 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 who is worthy to open the scroll? The question wasn't who is willing to open the scroll. It's who's worthy. I mean, there are a lot of people that would be willing to open that scroll. There have been world conquerors, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, uh, uh, Genghis Khan, uh, Hitler, uh, just name multiple people that would be willing to open this thing. But the question is not are you willing, it is are you worthy? And nobody was found worthy, and John started crying. And the, one of the elders comes off the throne and dries the tears in John's eyes and said, John, don't cry anymore, buddy. He said, L look up there. And John said, and I, I turned and I looked, and he said, the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy. And John turned around and looked, and the lion was a lamb in the center of the throne. And it was the lamb that was worthy. And then we spent all of chapter five in a worship service that just continued in heaven. The, the only thing that changed was the theme. In chapter four, the theme is you're worthy to be worshiped because you created everything. In chapter five, you're worthy to be worshiped because you redeemed everything. And at the end of chapter five now, we stand here where uh, the lamb has the scroll, uh, which is the title deed of the earth. He has proven worthy to be the only one in heaven, in earth, or under the earth to open this scroll. On earth, uh, uh, things are increasing. Intensity is, is moving forward. Uh, uh, the spirit of the age is, is, is running rampant. Uh, they're, 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 they're terrible movements that are going on on earth. And while all this is happening in heaven now, we're seeing this. And at the beginning of chapter 6, all of a sudden, our attention is drawn back to earth. Old rebel planet, you know, old rebel earth. While we've been having this tremendous worship service in heaven, what's been going on on earth? Well, 
The earth has been going down the tubes even further and further and further. <laughs> the earth is shaking. The earth is trembling. The earth is wicked. The earth is, the earth is moving in every way away from God and toward this uh, demonic uh, philosophies of the age and these, and, and these satanic philosophies of the days that we're living in. And so we're brought, brought back to the earth, and here's what the Bible says, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 6. Let's just read these, these six or eight verses, and you'll see. Now I, say, now I saw when the Lamb opened one of these seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come and see. In other words, one of those creatures, you remember there are four of them. One had the face of a man, one had the face of, a, of an ox, one had the face of an eagle, and one had the face of a, what was it I left out? A lion. And one of them, one of them says, Hey, John, come and see this. And so John, you know, comes over and he looks and I looked and behold, a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see, come and see this. And another horse, fiery red, went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the, fourth, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And so I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hell, or Hades, followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. Everybody say, the four horsemen. The four horsemen, you've heard that phrase? I know you have. Yeah, a lot of things. Notre Dame had four horsemen, right? The four horsemen is, are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Apo uh, uh, the word apocalypse is, it really means a prophetic re revelation, but it's come to mean uh, 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 the end of everything, cataclysmic, catastrophic end of everything. So with these four horses, there is loosed on earth um, some spirits, uh, just, just as, a, as a thought here. And I, I know you've probably heard people preach about the four horsemen of, of, of the book of Revelation. Uh, maybe you've heard some many things and you've had people talk to you about what they mean and how they, how they, uh, what they are and how they mean. But I believe, uh, I believe the Lord's given me a pretty clear word on this. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, by the way. I'm, <laughs> I'm just a preacher. And, uh, and I believe the Lord has, has really allowed me to see what this is. And, and I want to share with you what these horsemen are. One of the things I want you to notice, and I left verse 8 up here on purpose, because in verse 8, the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, gives us an idea about the riders on these horses. I mean, the horses are not really anything. They're just colored, you know. It's the riders who are described as being uh, the, the, the issuers of uh, some type of judgment of God. It's the riders who are important. And, and in verse 8, the Holy Spirit gives us an interpretation of who is riding on, on the pale horse. Everybody say, yucky green. That's the pale horse. Uh, I, I wrote in your notes, the word pale horse is chlorus, which we get chlorophyll, which is green. So the color of the pale horse was kind of like a, 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 a dead body turns, that kind of pale ashen green. When, after it dies and it's, you know, it's lifeless for some time, you, you look at it and it's that kind of a, of a palish greenish kind of a deal like that. That's the pale horse. And, uh, and so, yeah, you got a kind of a pale green looking deal. 
And, 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 but the writer is who is important. And notice what, who it says the writer is. It says the rider of the horse is, is death. And he's got somebody following behind him named hell. In other words, the riders are not people. The riders are things. The riders are events. The riders are entities. The rider on the pale horse is not a person that is represented in the tribulation period, but an event that is the, the event of death, the, the onslaught of something, a death. Is so what we know about this, our little friend context, and I wrote it in your notes for you. Remember context, right? Context will help you see lots of things in God's Word. They're not really difficult to see, and you don't have to get bent out of shape and, and try to find some kind of a, a strange reason or something to believe about it. Uh, context will tell you a lot of things. And the context of verse 8, which is the context of these horsemen, is God himself interprets the riders and says, you, you don't need to be looking for riders that are people. You need to be looking for riders that are events, riders who are things, happenings on the earth. And so that's what we do when we look at the rider on the white horse, and I'm going to just list it for you. And the, the first seal of the white horse is the spirit. It's a spirit that comes forth, the spirit of Antichrist. A lot of people have said, you know, the rider of the white horse is Jesus because he comes in on a white horse and he has a crown. And they look at Revelation 19 and they say, Jesus in Revelation 19 is riding on a white horse. And he has a crown. So is the rider of the white horse Jesus? Is the first, and the answer is no. Because at this moment right here, Jesus is in heaven. He's the Lamb of God opening the seals. This guy or this person is on earth. Jesus in Revelation 19 does ride a white horse, but that's the only thing that's the same. This guy has a bow with no arrows, by the way. Jesus has a sword that protrudes out of his mouth. With a sharp sword, he smites the nations. And this guy has a bow with no arrows, and Jesus has a sword. And Jesus is wearing, according to Revelation 19, many crowns, many diadem crowns. This is a Stephanos crowd, and it was given to him, and nobody gives Jesus his crowns. He's just got them. So this is not Jesus. I've entertained before and probably preached before that this is, this is the Antichrist. I mean, this is a person. This is, this is the Antichrist being released on this earth. And it does kind of fit because uh, the Antichrist does shoot blanks, you know, really. He, ha you know, he, has, he has bow but no arrows. So, you know, I can see how people would say, well, this is the Antichrist. But remember, uh, according to verse 8, these, these horsemen are not, people, their things, their, 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 their movements, their continuations of, of, of things that are happening on earth. And so I'm saying to you that the breaking of the first seal is just the opening up of something that is already happening on this earth. In other words, a spirit is loosed on this earth that just intensifies some of the activity that is happening right now on the earth because we know that the, the activity of the devil is being restrained. And, and, and here, I, I want to read 2 Thessalonians 2 because I've mentioned it many times to you in Revelation, but I, I, I've never read it, and I want to just read these 12 verses. Would that be okay? I want you to see this. Because this, you need to know this. This is, this is really relevant in, in, in seeing these horsemen come forth because what happens with the horsemen are uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is an evil that is moving on earth, and this evil is being restrained at this moment. And I know it doesn't seem like there's a lot of restraint, but I'm going to tell you if the Holy Spirit were not restraining what's going on on the earth right now, all of this spirit of anarchy and terrorism and uh, uh, values and the attack on Christianity and the attack on everything godly and righteous and upright, it would be way, it would be far worse than it is now. 
But something is restraining. And what is that something that's restraining? It's the Holy Spirit. And one of these days, that restraint is going to be pulled off. And this is what Paul is saying in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, I just, I'm going to just read it. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. In other words, this church at Thessalonica, uh, somebody was saying, man, I heard Paul say that Jesus has already come. Or I got a letter from Peter that Jesus had already come. Or, you know, there's a rumor at the church over there in Corinth that uh, Jesus has already come and we've been left behind. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Look, don't get all shook up. You've not been left behind. Uh, the Holy Spirit is still on the earth and Jesus is still hurt, uh, here on earth. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So what is that saying to us? That's saying, Jesus, uh, Paul is saying to us that this, there's gonna be a revealing, there's gonna be an opening up one day and there's gonna be a son of perdition that is revealed, everybody say, the Antichrist. Antichrist. Yeah, he's gonna be revealed one day, but, but before he's revealed, there's gonna be a great falling away. There's gonna be, be some actions that begin to happen that prepare the way for him. Because how many of you know that the Antichrist is going to have to control this earth very quickly? When the, when the Antichrist is revealed uh, within three and a half years, which is the first half of tribulation, tribulation only lasts seven years. The last three and a half years is horrible. It's called the great tribulation in the Bible. It's a, it's a terrible, horrible time where all kind of catastrophic, violent things happen on this earth. The Antichrist is already in control. And, and, and so for the first three and a half years, he has to basically gain control of all the earth. So he's got to move fast is what I'm saying to you. And, and it would make sense logically. I think you could see this. It would make sense that before this tribulation period starts, he will have to have already begun uh, the ability to take over this earth. So in other words, the earth has to be softened up so that it will receive someone like the Antichrist, so that it'll be ready for someone like the Antichrist, so it'll be uh, responsive to somebody like the Antichrist who promises peace and safety and, 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 and preaches you know, reconciliation and, and gives the earth the idea that, that he can bring it all together and that he can bring peace and he can bring safety and, and he can pull all this together and all these horrible things that are happening. If you'll just let me you know, be, vote for me, uh, elect me, select me, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be the answer to all of your needs. Now, that has to happen within three and a half years. That's fast. So before it happens, the earth has to be prepared for that to happen. And I'm submitting to you, look around you. Look at the attitudes. Look at the, the, the movements. Look at what hap what's happening in society. The white horse cast a long shadow... <laughs> And, 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 and right now, the Holy Spirit is restraining. Let me, let me go on. Uh, let's, let me go back to verse three. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Yeah, that's right. We're falling away. That's right. We're being led away. That's right. We're being asked to accept things that 50 years ago, you would never say would be accepted. 30 years ago, you would have laughed if somebody said, we're going to have LBGKQP21576, whatever it is. And you can have 14 brands of sexuality. You can be a man that identifies as a woman who identifies as a child and as an elephant. You know, that's what you are. I mean, come on. How ludicrous. How ridiculous. But that's being accepted in our world today just in preparation for someone who's going to lead with all of these kind of deceitful things. That's just, uh, that's just a, a preparation attitude on this earth that will allow this earth to receive all of this crazy, loony uh, uh, preaching of the Antichrist. 
Mm who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do, not, uh, do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he might be revealed in his own time? Paul saying there's something holding him back so that he can be revealed when he's supposed to be revealed. I'm asking you, what is holding him back? <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God on this earth keeps him from doing what he wants to do. If he could do what he wants to do, he would destroy you right now. I mean, he would annihilate everything. But there's something that's restraining him. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The old King James word was the spirit of iniquity. Iniquity, you know what iniquity means? Iniquity means to bend or twist, to distort. In other words, the spirit that is now moving on this earth to prepare this earth to receive an antichrist very quickly is a spirit that distorts or twists things. Like sexuality, like morality, like decency. The earth is being pushed away from anything Christ-like or God-like or, or anything to do with the Bible or people of the Bible or people that, I mean, Christians are being looked at as being enemies of the state or enemies of the people of the earth. The twisting of, of these things, the spirit is already at work, the apostle says, and, 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 then this lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's the Lord, and he's going to do that. And that by, the, the next verses say, I'm not sure, they're, they're not up there, but the next verses talk about uh, how the Holy Spirit is going to be withdrawn, and then he's going to be able to be revealed because the Holy Spirit is going to be taken out of the way so that he can do whatever he would do on the earth. I put, on the, I put up here for you just a couple of things, and I, I want to just mention it, and, I, and then I'm gone with it. I'm saying to you that the white horse is a, is a spirit of Antichrist. It is a spirit that prepares the way for the earth to be taken over by someone who, is, who will be the Antichrist. These seals and the breaking of these seals are basically a, just a continuation of activity that's happening on earth right now. The only difference will be that the Holy Spirit will be removed and there will be no restraint over these activities that are happening right now. And I think you can see us moving toward these very things. This white horse cast a long shadow. Just, these are some of the philosophies and thinkings that I'm, that, that, that I'm talking about that are already happening on this earth. And think about these things being released with no restraint. Uh, evolution. Evolution says there's no real evidence that God exists. The universe is simply a, re a result of chance. How many of you are aware that within my lifetime, I'm... 62 and a half, six, I'm moving at 63 years old. I can remember when evolution used to be a theory. And it's a crazy one. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, there's more, it, it takes more faith to believe that junk than it does to believe that God did it. But now it's not taught as a theory. Now I guarantee you, if you ask any of your children or any of your grandchildren, uh, they'll accept evolution as being the way people got here on earth. It, it, it's just a spirit of the age. Situational e ethics. There's no right. There's no absolute rules. You, you decide what's right and wrong. And, 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 and this uh, allows people to create their own rules. And get rid of these archaic rules like uh, male and female and marriage, you know. Uh, you can marry anything. You, know, you, can, you can marry your pet now. And I mean, it's going to, I mean that, what allows that? It's these spirits that go forth that are being restrained, and, and, and we can see them already moving. Moral freedom, everyone, including children of any age, should be exposed to all viewpoints that are realistic. 
but they don't consider the gospel realistic. I mean, they consider any kind of a perversion or sexual or uh, uh, any kind of thing, any kind of value system. Uh, you expose these kids to this. It doesn't matter how young they are or how immature they are. Uh, but you can't expose them to Christianity because Christianity is considered unrealistic. I mean, these are spirits that are alive, sexual per permissiveness. All forms of sexual expression are acceptable. And I put that L-G-B-T-Q-I-A-P-K. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a real list right there. It's ridiculous. Those are all the different values. I mean, there are probably four or five more now. Anti-Christian bias, the Christian religion and its, and its morality is harmful. It's either meaningless or irrelevant uh, to the question of survival of the human race. Globalism, we're all global citizens. You watch the news, you hear, you hear the, the, the talk that we're interested in all being one big part of one big world and one big global thing telling you one of the things that Trump is running into right now is he believes that we ought to be our own country. And look at the junk he's taken for that. That's, that's a spirit, a spirit that says we're part of the big globe and let's get in the globe and we're in the big market and we need to worry about all of these treaties, treaties and trade and all of this with everybody in the world because all the world is what we should be interested in, not just our own country. That's globalism. And you see that spirit. Humanism. Man should take charge of his own future and realize that he has within himself the power to achieve, uh, uh, achieve the world of his dreams. Practically everything you watch, hear, read, or train uh, is tainted by missionaries of the humanist religion. I, I don't even want to get into that, but I guarantee you that the education systems of our world are just overrun with humanism. And what is this? These are, these are attitudes and, and, and characteristics that are already loosed on our earth that when the seal is broken and there's no restraint will be intensified and will prepare this world for this Antichrist who is going to come. So the rider of the white horse, I think, is the Antichrist or the spirit of the Antichrist, seal number two. Seal number two is the red horse, and I call it the spirit, spirit of terror. Let me read the verse to you. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Now, we have today, already on the earth, a spirit of terror and war, there's only been about six months in the entire history of the world that there hadn't been wars going on on this earth. Jesus himself in Matthew 25 said that we were going to hear of wars and rumors of war, and he said, and let not your heart be troubled. So Jesus himself was saying, look, the fact that you're going to have wars and rumors of war is not really a sign of my coming because that's gonna, you're going to have that on the earth all the time. And he was right. What is a sign that he is coming, according to 1 Thessalonians, is all of the earth is going to be crying peace and safety. And, uh, and, and Paul says, when you hear everyone crying peace and safety, you, do you hear any of that today? <laughs> Peace and safety, let's get together. Everything can be good. We have peace and safety, we want to protect and we want to have a great land and we want to be safe. And we, when all of the world begins to cry peace and safety, uh, Paul says, then sudden destruction shall come upon them like, like, like travail upon a, a woman with child and, and they shall not escape. Now notice that the red horse has, this, has the ability to do what? To take peace from the earth. 
In other words, the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist in, in the first seal has promised the earth that he can fix everything and that he'll take care of everything. And the earth will say, thank God you came along because look at all these horrible situations. And the, and the Antichrist will say, I got it, I got it. I'll bring peace and save it. Then all of a sudden the rider of the red horse comes forth and all of that fake peace, that false peace, that 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 uh, not genuine peace, uh, the rider on the red horse will have the power to take that peace away from the earth and that people would kill one another and, and, and unto him was given a great sword. The fact that he has a great sword means that this, this killing is going to be mass. I mean, the sword represents the ability to kill. It's really talking about a tremendous weapon. When the Bible, in Bible days, the sword was the most fearsome weapon that a warrior had. So whenever you see someone given a sword, it's basically, uh, he's gonna, it's gonna be massive. He's gonna be, and the fact that he has a great sword means there's gonna be a lot of death and a lot of destruction on this earth. Terrorism. I mean, the warfare that we have nowadays is not like World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, where we had an enemy and they had a uniform on and they fought against us and we fought against them. Uh, I mean, nowadays, uh, people look just like you, dress like you, walk like you, uh, stand near you in a restaurant and blow themselves up and kill about 25 or 30 people. I mean, you know, warfare is altogether different nowadays. And there's a spirit of terror and the red horse just releases that and it just becomes more prominent. And then came the rider on the black horse, the spirit of privilege. Now, I know that might seem a little weird because you would probably think, no, this is talking about a famine. Well, it is talking about a famine, but I don't think the torment of this is really all about a famine, although a famine is horrible. But look at what it says about the rider of the black horse. The rider of the black horse, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked up, so I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Now this pair of scales is not a balanced scale like you make judgment by. You know, uh, 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 the symbol for the law and, and all of that is the blind woman with the balance and, you know, and that's like justice is supposed to be blind. Everybody laugh about that. Yeah, that's not what it's not. These are not scales to, uh, uh, about justice because look what these, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat is for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and don't harm the oil and wine. So these scales are used to measure food. So what's going on when the, when the, when the black horse seal is broken? Well, quite possibly because of the wars and the terrorism and the destruction that is, that is unleashed when the red horse comes forward, it has damaged the earth to the point that now the earth doesn't produce enough food. Because the earth doesn't produce enough food, certain people start having trouble getting food. And who is it that's going to have trouble getting food? It's going to be the working man. This verse is described the fact that um, supplies of food are going to be at such a low level that, that a person will have to work a whole day to buy enough food to keep themselves alive for one day. Uh, a quart of wheat is what it takes to keep one person alive for one day. Not a family alive, not your wife or your husband or some of your kids or your grandparents. It's just enough to keep you alive for one day. During the Bible days, people would work all day for a Denarius. And what this verse is saying is that when the black horse is released, things are going to be so bad that the common man, the working man, the person who's uh, struggling, you know, with life and, 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 and barely keeping ahead of life, they're going to they're gonna have to pay a, a whole day's wage just to get enough food to keep themselves alive. I mean, forget your car note, forget the house note, forget the gas in your car. You got to give everything you made that day just to keep yourself alive. Or you can take three quarts of barley, which is 
uh, an inferior uh, product to wheat and doesn't have as many vitamins and blah, blah as wheat does, but you can get a little more roughage and a little more bulk getting three quarts of barley for a day's wage, but you're going to be in trouble. But look at what it says at the end, and do not harm the oil and wine. I'm saying that the torment of the black horse is not only that famine hits this earth and inflation due to famine. If you don't have much food and you have a lot of people, all of a sudden that little bit of food costs a lot of money. Inflation. <laughs> inflation. But we don't have inflation for those who use the oil and the wine. Everybody say the rich people. This verse says that the rich people are going to do all right. The luxuries of life, the oil and wine are luxury items. And the command, I mean, this, is, this is the only horse that anybody in heaven says anything to. When the white horse goes out, nobody says anything. When the red horse goes out, nobody says anything. On this, whenever he goes out, all of a sudden a voice comes out of the throne. So who's speaking this? Well, it either has to be the father or the lamb. And, and, and they say, I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart, you know, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley, and don't hurt the oil and wine. I'm telling you that I think the torment of the black horse is going to be that you and I, who most of us are common people, most of us work for a living, most of us uh, live just a little bit ahead of, <laughs> of, of the collectors, you know. I mean, we don't have a lot of extra resources. We're blue collar. We're going to have to struggle. I mean, I'm not because I'm going to be gone and, and pray that you will too, but the people that are like us on this earth are going to have a real hard time when the black horse is loosed because they're going to have to struggle every day just to feed themselves, much less their family or anybody they love. But the rich person that lives a couple of doors down, they're going to do fine because the oil and the, the, oil and the wine are luxury items. And I'm, you, know, you know, the torment of this to me is that some people are privileged and you know it. They don't suffer like you suffer. They seem to be doing fine in the midst of all of this kind of stuff. You're struggling every day, but they're living high, wide, and handsome. Doesn't that torture you? Doesn't that torment you? To think that they get away with stuff, that if you did it, you'd, they'd put you under the jailhouse, but they just seemingly with, 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 no, uh, with no restraint can do anything they want to do and nothing ever happens to them. Doesn't that, doesn't that just doesn't that rise up in you? Doesn't that, doesn't that make you mad when, when you see things like that? I think the black horse, Jesus is saying, boy, that's what's going to happen. And there are going to be a lot of people that are just jealous and envious because some people are going to be privileged and some people are not. So here's the black horse and you got famine coming forth and man, people are starving to death and, the, and terrorism is on the earth. And then the last one is the pale horse. It's the spirit of death. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and hell or Hades followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death and by the beast of the earth. This is tremendous death. I know the big question is when it says it is given to him to kill a fourth part of the earth the question is, is that, is that like geographically a fourth of the earth? Or is it the fourth of the population of the earth? Well, I'm going to just say to you, and I put it in your notes, that either one of those is catastrophic on this earth. <laughs> if you get the right fourth of the earth, like Europe, Europe right there, you know, where, Russia, China, I mean, you're the, the, or European, if you get that fourth, if you took, took that fourth of the earth, that, that area, that land mass rep represents 29%. So it's very close to a fourth of the earth. And if you took that one, 62% of the population of the earth live in that one fourth. A lot, a lot of people. What did I represent it on? You know, I said something, uh, I figured it out. Uh, that would be uh, 4.5 billion people. 
If that 25% was the 25% that, that death decided would, would take out, that would be 4.5 billion people. What kind of catastrophic event would that be? Man, you'd have to have some real, uh, I mean, man, you, you, atomic bombs, nuclear blast, uh, uh, chemicals, warfare, uh, gas, uh, plagues, uh, pestilences. I mean, you'd have to take out that many people, 4.5 billion with a B, billion people. My Lord, and if you're just talking about 25% of the population of the earth, there are 7.1 billion people on the earth right now. So 25% of that would be like 1.5 billion people. 1.5 billion people, a lot of people. But this seal is broken, and notice all of the other riders are given basically one weapon with which the judgment of God falls, you know, either a sword or a, a bow with no arrows, which means the Antichrist is going to take over without a fight, without a struggle. That bow with no arrows means, you know, he's going to look like a warrior, but he shoots blanks because he doesn't have any arrows. So he's going to be very deceptive and very cunning, and he's going to basically con his way into leadership. And then the red horse has a great sword, and he's given that weapon, you know, and then the black horse has a pair of scales and it's famine and horrible uh, uh, things that happen with the economy and inflation and food shortages and all of that. But notice the pale horse, he's given four weapons. He can kill with the sword. Everybody say war, uh, man, uh, bombs, uh, uh, mass uh, times of, of armies and fighting and people dying by the millions and with hunger, say famine. So he's given the weapon of famine. With all of this destruction that's taking place on earth, man, who's going to grow stuff and where is it going to grow? And one nuclear blast and you've eliminated a whole section of the world for the next hundred years to be able to grow anything or do anything with. Nuclear radiation just becomes a real key to no food on the earth. And with death, that means like pestilences, things that we thought were gone, like, like right now. I mean, I, I, you don't hear this on the news, but the five major diseases that we had eliminated off the earth are making a comeback. Do you know this? You don't hear it on the news because no one wants to talk about it because it doesn't fit the scenario that they want to put forth. Because populations are being allowed into other populations, these populations from other places who have never been, uh, who have never, who have never had any, uh, uh, any of their shots, any, any inoculations against measles and mumps and. Uh, and, and, and tuberculosis and uh, whooping cough and all of these uh, disastrous diseases that in our country we've eliminated because we've vaccinated everybody for the last hundred years that lives in this country, but people come into this country who haven't been vaccinated and they bring with them tuberculosis and whooping cough and measles and mumps and plagues and all of that kind of stuff. And pe just people just get them by the thousands. Well, they make a comeback because of this globalism stuff and all of this craziness that doesn't make a bit of sense about how to protect yourself from the dangers of the world we live in. So the black, the rider of the pale horse has this weapon. And then by the beast of the earth, it might mean that the very animals themselves, because of all of this ecological disaster, and they've been moved away from their food sources, that they even begin to attack human beings, and they kill human beings. But, just one word about that. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the word beast is used 38 times. Every other time, but this one, it is interpreted as the Antichrist and the false prophet. So what I'm saying to you is that the beast of the earth 
I think, are people. They are, they are, they are leaders. They are, they are commanders of the earth that basically turn against their own people. They murder their own people. They, they don't, yeah, the politicians, they don't care about others and they don't care about their own people and they'll, and they'll do whatever is politically uh, strategic at the time. Now, these are the spirits that are loosed on this earth when these four seals are broken. And what they are are continuations of what we already see on this earth as happening. Every day when you watch the news, uh, whatever you watch, whatever you listen to, you hear these spirits that are there, and you hear these spirits encouraging you to move in, in the direction. Don't think this is weird. Don't think this is wrong. Don't look at this as being bad or good. Just accept it. I mean, it's the way things are. It's the way life is, and it's just preparation. It's just softening this crazy world up for someone to be able to step right in because they only have three and a half years to become the ruler of the world because in the middle of the tribulation period, they have to do something tremendously terrible that starts the last three and a half years. So they have to be permanently in place. They have to be totally trusted. They have to be totally liked. They have to be totally in control, totally powerful within three and a half years. And I'm just saying, what you're seeing right now is the preparation so that the world will be able to receive a person like that quickly, very quickly. So we're seeing the seeds of that being planted right now. And what the seals do, and these four, especially these four seals, it just, it just breaks the restraining of the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about this. As bad as it is right now, what would it be like if there was no church here? What would it be like if there was no Christian here? No value here. No, no Holy Spirit restraining this. What would this crazy earth be like? It would be the wild, wild west. And, and, and we're moving right toward that. Now, the question you say is, how can I protect my family from this? Well, the only suggestion I have to you is, number one, make sure that you know the Lord. I mean, that you are for real, that you know Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I am the way, not one of many ways. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, <laughs> you're not in the family. And that's not what I say. That's what the Bible says. Jesus says this, and, it, and unless Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about or he's lying to us, which I don't think either one of those are possible, then you must know Christ. Do you know Christ? Do you, do you, does your family know Christ? And secondly, pay attention. I mean, look at what's happening around you. Look at what's happening in your world. Try to maintain some sense of right and wrong and morality and life because the Holy Spirit will help you keep, keep at least those that you can influence uh, uh, with your eyes open to what's going on in this world. And then stay in the Word. I mean, prepare yourself with the Word. Look, I believe the, I believe the, the, the Lord gave us the book of Revelation so He could reveal to us how things were going to be in these days that we're living in. And knowing what's happening and being able to see it happen around us makes us watchful. It makes us, uh, it makes us uh, witnesses. It makes us uh, cling to the truth even greater so that we can not be surprised and we can protect our own and we can make sure those we love and our families and that we, there would be an urgency that they might know the Lord. Because I'm saying to you that if we can already see these spirits loosed on the earth, which they are, every one of them I talked about, are already being loosed on the earth. The only difference is when they're loosed by the horsemen, they're just blown wide open because there's no restraint of the Holy Spirit. So do you know the Lord?
Is Jesus living in your heart? Do you need to receive him today? That's the call of the day. Would you stand to your feet? Let me just... 